All right, here we go. The connection might be a little spotty tonight. We have a thunderstorm rolling through and it's already cut out a few times, so we will do the best we can and uh, teach. That's what I'm here for. Uh, today we're going to talk about substrate. Now, substrate might be a word you don't know if you're not in America or just maybe you don't know that word. It is the gravel or whatever we put on the bottom of the aquarium. So could be marbles, could be sand, could be gravel, could be big lava rocks, and there's a lot of choices we have. Now, in the aquarium hobby, typically we settle down a few paths. That would be like uh, sand, normal gravel, plant substrate, and maybe crushed coral if you're into salt water. I feel like those are the main ones, but we could go in any direction. Um, so I'm going to try and cover a lot of things. Not so much this is what you should buy but more how do we choose what we'd want to buy and i know that seems like why not just tell me well if we can understand why we would choose something then i don't have to make a recommendation a million times over people can watch the video and go oh i have this type of water i should do this so uh first thing someone in the chat said oh i'm getting a brand new tank i've never had a tank i'm getting plants i'm going to buy a plant soil and you know blah blah, blah go down the road uh, so my first thing is don't assume anything. So just because you're getting plants, it does not mean you should get a planted, uh, substrate necessarily. Right? So let's think about it. The primary goal, I would say that, you know, if we step back like four steps, what is the main reason we put something in the bottom of our aquarium? It is to give the fish something as a bottom. If there's just glass, you see reflections, sometimes that can be a problem. Uh, not a problem in all fish, but some it is, right? And then we kind of like the look of a substrate. Something in the bottom gives us like, oh, there's the bottom, and then we build our stuff on top of that, right? So that's the very pri like primal level of like, we just want it to look good, right? And that is a very important part because a lot of what we do in fish keeping is for it to look cool. Now, a lot of times people might get into it because they're like, oh, I like the ocean, so I want sand. Yes, we can do that. Um, but, you know, let's start talking about what I think are the important things to think about. One, is the substrate inert? So what does that mean? Inert means that it doesn't change water parameters for the most part. It doesn't make pH go up or down. It doesn't change the hardness. It doesn't change the alkalinity. It doesn't change the nutrients. So some fertilizers or some substrates would have fertilizer in it that would help plants, right? Uh, so there's all these little things we got going on with what, based on what we pick, could change the way our water is even, right? And then we've got things to think about. Uh, so if it is inert and it doesn't change water, then maybe we need to think about the animals we're gonna keep in this water. So for instance, if we have goldfish, uh, if we have, you know, kind of bigger sized pebbles, sometimes that's a choking hazard right? If we have very fine sand, sometimes that's very good for uh, sand sifting species. So that'd be like Corydoras. That would be uh, uh, rams, epistogrammas, geophagus or earth eaters as they're called. A lot of different other types of uh, catfish, stingrays. So there's, you know, we might choose the substrate based on what the animal needs as well. You know, like something like an oxalotl, which I kind of lump into fish tanks or like, you know, tropical fish, even though they're not tropical. Uh, they don't want to, you know, get impacted and swallow rocks and that kind of stuff. So, you know, we have a choice of will it affect water parameters? We have a choice of is it good for the animals? We also have a choice of do we like it? And with good for animals, maybe we'll lump in like a different type of animal be the plants. Like, oh, based on what we're putting in, I might target towards that. All right, so... That's a lot going on on such a, oh, I just kind of walk in and I just, I, I, I buy that one, you know. You, you might be presented with something like in the thumbnail there where all the substrates are laid out. You're picking based on color or based on size or something like that. Now, there is additives to substrates, okay? And some of the additives would be live bacteria. That would be known as an active um, substrate. And that comes in both freshwater and saltwater. There's fertilizer substrates, so they might be soaked in fertilizer, like fertilizer for plants, or they themselves might be fertilizer, like if we use a dirt substrate, right? So that's literally dirt out of a yard or, 
or some organic milk, miracle grow, something like that. Be very high in nitrogen and that kind of stuff. And you guys will see a little bit more about that in a video coming out from a fish room I toured. And uh, he's been doing some experiments and he talks a lot about his experience, which is good because it always it's good to get other people's opinion besides just mine. So you've got, uh, you know, the additive portion of it. There's probably some other additives I don't know about yet. Um, or not that I don't know about that I can't think of off the top of my head. But those are the main ones I see is like this will buffer, uh, you know, this will give you more fertilizer or this will give you live bacteria. And they're typically a wet substrate, but not always like a, an ADA soil, a fluval stratum, a Dennerlay, aquascaper soil. They'd be more clay and dry based and same with dirt, right? So we've got additives on top of that. And then we've got the non-inert substrates. And that would be some of these uh, planted substrates, right? ADA soil, fluval stratum, basically those, I guess the word would be humic because it's got a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of tannins in it and like, and I guess raw material that breaks down, right? All of those naturally, when you have something that's breaking down, will be um, kind of lowering pH into different degree degrees. You know, it's not all equal and based on how much we use in the surface area. And we'll talk about that, like substrate depths, surface area, what does that mean to us and what it might mean with some of the chemical reactions going on with some of this stuff. And uh, so, yes, those might lower pH, right? We also might have an instance where um, something like crushed coral or limestone would raise pH because if we have softer water, maybe it's dissolving in. Limestone, I find, dissolves more hardness into the water based ex except more hardness as opposed to, the word I was looking for as opposed to, uh, like crushed coral, which would be more pH based, less alkalinity on both of them. Uh, so I think I'm going to start going through just different types of substrates and giving my personal list of pros and cons and what I would use it for and what may I might not use it for if I know like, oh, I wouldn't use it for that specifically. Um, so I'm going to start with the basic, basic, basic gravel. And what I mean by that is that is a gravel that you could walk in, you could buy it at a, a PetSmart, a Petco, a Walmart, local fish store, doesn't matter. It's the, the quintessential like, got a tropical fish on the bag, this goes in your aquarium, right? Could be blue, green, could be natural colored, doesn't matter. That rough size comes in two different, I guess, variants. It's got like a sharp version, which for me, the sharp version is pretty much the no-go option. If I was if I was ever going to buy it, try not to buy one that's got all the sharp edges. And then there's like a rounded one, right? And I would always opt for the rounded one as opposed to the jagged one. And the reason why I say that is because it's not so much for fish, like, oh, they get cut or anything like that. Uh, it is more because we want it to not compact so much. So in your, you know, maybe around your home or at least probably somewhere in your life you've experienced a gravel road or gravel in front of a restaurant or a house or something like that. And when they use the uh, pointed gravel, it really locks together and becomes compact, right? But if we, if you've ever walked on like pea gravel that's all rounded, every step you take, it like never locks into place, right? And in our own aquariums, we kind of like that. We don't necessarily want a super hard and rigid substrate for plants or fish to dig in or even to get our gravel back into. And if you ever need that experiment, you know, set up a tank with that sharp gravel versus one with rounded gravel, then go to gravel vac it. And it's actually kind of hard to get the gravel vac into that sharp because it is so compacted. So about the only substrate I think is the I would absolutely never use is probably that very sharp colored gravel. Now there are other sharp substrates I would use, but that one there's like no benefit to it besides maybe it's a little bit cheaper, but there's not enough cost savings there. The thing to know about these colored substrates is typically they've been dyed. And so, you know, to get that blue rock, that blue rock doesn't exist, so we dye it, right? And then on a lot of the tumbled stones, we'll dye it and then we'll uh, kind of polish it or put an epoxy on it. It's really common for a lot of this stuff to have epoxies. And over time, very long periods of time, that epoxy will wear off and kind of flake off into the water. That can be problematic. Different 
brands and runs of substrate and stuff like that uh, will have different longevities. Some you'll never, ever, ever see a problem and some you'll see problems within the first three months, right? Um, and in general, I've found that some of the chain stores have some of the lower quality gravel and then some of the mom and pop stores typically have um, better. And the reason why I say that is because they probably have sold it for many, many years and know they're like, oh, this one does well where that one was kind of cruddy and we had problems so we discontinued it, right? So, uh, but the normal gravel, why I love it so much is because one, aesthetically it usually looks pretty good and two, it is inert. It pretty much doesn't do anything and that's good. That's a good baseline of like, oh, it, it's not bad, it's not great and we can take it anywhere we want. So we can plant a plant a tank in there. We can have goldfish. We can have, uh, you know, all the tropical fish we want. It's easy to gravel vac. Like it just, that's the baseline, right? That's the starting point. That is as basic as it gets right there, right? So then we could, uh, you know, transition to, I think the next most logical is to sidestep to sand. Because I feel like when when people enter the hobby, that's that's the point, right? They're either gravel or they're sand. That's for most people are making that decision, right? With sand, uh, usually it's very cheap. That's a good thing. Uh, the surface area can be very high, which is a good thing. It's got very small particles, which could be a good or a bad thing. And it comes in a few different colors, mostly natural colors, which is nice. We don't have to worry about epoxies, you know, so we've got that going for us. And it can be great for the sand sifters, as we talked about, and that kind of stuff. So kind of a lot of positives going on, right? But let's start looking at what some of the negatives might bring with it. So maybe we've got some sand sifters in there, and they're grabbing a mouthful of sand, and they're you know working it through their gills or spitting it back out. Usually some of that will end up in our filters uh, just because they spit it out near an intake, and maybe it kind of gets sucked in, and the finest particles stay waterborne. And so that can that can lead to some extra wear on the you know the impellers, which is like the part that drives a pump. Uh, if you have sponge filters, not so much of a problem. Or a pre intake, pre filter that helps a bunch as well. Doesn't prevent it 100%, but it helps a bunch, right? Uh, and it also could be a good uh, breeding ground for you know worms and that kind of stuff to live down in the substrate, which is a good thing I think. But at the same time, we might find that sand tends to compact. If you're ever at the beach and you grab a handful of sand and you lift it out of the water or you lift it above ground and you make a fist and it kind of stays like that, right? That that mound, like a sand castle, is what it does in your aquarium, okay? Whereas like if you take a big, you know, a handful of gravel or rocks and you open your hand, they fall back down because they don't compact. And naturally, what that does in your aquarium couple things. The first thing, a very compact substrate doesn't have very good water flow, right? So we could think about if all the rocks were spread out over my hand and water was flowing over it, getting a lot of flow, a lot of oxygen. If we had it so it was all stacked up in a sand pile, only the outside of the sand or the part on the outside would be interacting with oxygen for the most part. Uh, and that's where a lot of times you can run into trouble a little bit in our home aquariums because Maybe we are still gravel vacuuming it. Maybe uh, we're relying on it more than we should. So let me explain how that could happen. Maybe you've got a bunch of sand in there. Everything's going great. You get in and you gravel vac really well because you haven't done it in a while, right? And you mix up all that sand. Well, that top, like about half inch or so, was fully uh, kind of alive with bacteria. And it was, it was really helping process waste in your aquarium and it was doing things, right? And then maybe the other inch and a half you had wasn't that same type of bacteria. It was a different bacteria. And so the top layer had lots of access to fresh water and oxygen. And down below, we didn't really have that going on. So maybe we had anaerobic bacteria growing. So that means bacteria that doesn't need oxygen or prefers not to have oxygen. That does a different process. What that can do is it can actually eat nitrates, which is good. But at the same time, we don't have great flow going through there. So we're not eating that many. And this method would be called a deep sand bed used in saltwater tanks, used in some freshwater aquariums. Um, but 
in the freshwater world, I feel like we've got some better alternatives. And one of the main problems I have with sand, and don't get me wrong, I have sand, I have a coarse sand in my 800 gallon right now, and I believe every aquarium has different uh, needs, right? So that aquarium has uh, Mabu puffer fish, it's got sand sifting fish, it's got all kinds of stuff, and um, that works for that. But I don't think any other of my aquariums really have it, so it's a specific reason I'm doing that. Now, I'm not using it for its deep sand bed properties. I'm not even really growing plants in it. And that's kind of something to be brought up. In my opinion, sand is one of the hardest substrates to grow plants. Now, it's not impossible, but if you were going, I'm going to do something, usually I try to not set myself up for, this will be the hardest way to do that, right? And so let's do a little bit of thinking about sand. When we go to the beach, a lot of times where uh, the beach is, there's not a whole lot of plants. There might be a sprig here and a sprig way over there and a tree that managed to make it, right? But if you go back 20, 30 feet, right, back from the shoreline, usually you'll see like, wow, there's tons of plants. But then when you look at the substrate, if you will, the sand will fade into more gravel or normal type of substrate. More stuff's mixed in. And because we mix stuff in, it makes a more aerated substrate, which allows plant roots to actually expand well. And that's kind of one of the bigger differences between a lot of substrates and sand is the ability for plant roots to really spread out and get a good foothold and thrive. And so even if they have good roots out, we also need the water to be able to carry nutrients and oxygen down into that root layer. If it can't, which sometimes sand can get that way, we've got a problem. So that's just why typically I lean away from sand. And if I do, I want it to be a much, much coarser sand, much more than pool filter sand, you know. Uh, but I do believe it's one of the most used substrates, especially for African cichlids and fish that dig all the time. And it looks great. I'm not going to claim it doesn't look great because it does. Um, one thing I would avoid, I would avoid bright white sand and black sand. Just like your car at home, those are the colors that really show when they're dirty. So the minute your fish goes poop, that white sand shows it really well, and then black sand also shows it really well. That brown piece of poop sitting there sticks out a ton, right? So that's, I would go with something that's like a tannish or a mix. Like I, I really prefer it, it having a mix so that way that um, any poop or anything like that kind of blends in. Like, okay, it doesn't stick out like, oh, geez, got to clean over there, right? And so when we think about that, you know, keep sand in mind of like, okay, maybe it's not the best for doing plants, but I would wager most aquariums that ever get set up aren't meant for plants. So that kind of becomes, no, oh, that doesn't really matter, right? And sometimes a very fine layer, you could think about, well, instead of doing two inches, what if I only did half an inch? Wouldn't that technically give me the half inch of good live bacteria I wanted and none of the downfall? Yes, that, that would be a true statement also. So you could get away with that, but then you couldn't do plants, but that's fine, right? So we want to know the strengths and the weaknesses of each substrate. And uh, so I'll move on to the next. We've covered gravel. Now we've covered uh, sand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the one that I love the most. And this is the one that I have. I, I brought in 14 bags or 40 pounds each. So what is that? Uh, well, it's 14 times 4. So it's 40, uh, 56, 560 pounds of crushed coral is in my garage right now that I have to clean. I got to rinse it a ton, right? We could bring that up too. Uh, sometimes like a, a sand from Home Depot, you might have to spend hours cleaning and another sand maybe is already cleaned for you. It's crushed coral, not already cleaned. It's, it's kind of a, a dusty material. But why do I like crushed coral? I like crushed coral because... Um, it has the property of buffering pH. And in my water here, I have very low pH and I have no buffer, right? So if my water comes out uh, at, let's say 6.0, it's, it's more like 6.5, but let's say it's at 6.0 6 and there's nothing in the water. And that's, that's pretty close. There's almost nothing in my water, no calcium, no magnesium, just nothing, right? Every time we change water, naturally we have to kind of reconstitute that because water that just has nothing in it is not good for plants and it's not good for fish. Crushed coral happens to be something that when you take acidic water, 
and you put it on there, it dissolves in and adds some minerals back into the water. And so we typically get a pH that rises up and we get some buffering capacity and small levels of calcium and uh, you know other little trace elements that are in that coral, right? So that's why I love to use it. And I, I'll even use it in planet tanks. I actually, every aquarium we have both here at the studio and at our store gets a little bit of crushed coral mixed in. We use one pound per 10 gallons of water mixed into that substrate, right? And that brings up a good point. You can mix substrates. Just know that some substrate mixes look terrible. Some look okay. And then the thing to really know is lighter substrates. So let's say I mix sand and gravel, right? Uh, when I go to gravel vac and I tumble everything, typically I'm going to pull the sand higher in the thing and the gravel will be a little bit lower and it's tumbling, right? And then when I move the gravel vac, rocks settle, sand sits on top. But after a week or two, it'll start shifting downward again. And so mixing different size substrate or different consistencies can be a problem. Different weights for sure is a problem. And so what I like about crushed coral is it is that jagged part that we talked about way at the beginning, right? We're like, oh, if it's all jagged, it sticks and like doesn't move. That helps it keep its place when you mix it with maybe uh, a gravel or something like that, or even, you know, I've got it mixed in with a plant substrate in my, my living room, for instance, right? So crushed coral has these properties, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about crushed coral because I love it, and I think a lot of people don't understand it. At 6.0 pH, when you have crushed coral, it's going to dissolve very quickly, right? So it might go from 6 to 7 overnight, but then it might take a week or two to go to 7.2. And then at 7.2, it might take three months to go to 7.5. And from 7.5 to 7.8 might take three years, right? Meanwhile, we're doing some water changes, and each time we change water, we're actually uh, resetting it a little bit. So we, we usually find a happy medium, and I do in my aquariums, and that might be you're sitting around 7.2 to 7.4. Uh, coming from way down low, that sounds amazing for me, and that's why I use so much crushed coral. So I'll use crushed coral in a planet tank, I'll use it in a tetra tank, I'll use it in an African cichlid tank, I'll use it in a puffer tank, I'll use it almost everywhere, right? And there are some alternatives. You could look into like aragonite, dolomite, um, limestone, all of those, they, they do the same thing. They're going to dissolve into water, but they might be more heavy in calcium and less on the minerals that are going to raise pH. Like each one does its own little thing. And if you do a little bit of Googling, you know, if you Google dolomite forum, you're going to be able to read some what people have found. Oh, this much dolomite did this to my water, right? Or I was lacking this. I added dolomite. And this is what happened. Same for aragonite. Same for uh, crushed coral. Crushed coral also comes in sands, but I, I almost never use uh, sand myself because of I like to use plants with most of my setups. And so, you know, same with aragonite. It'll come in a sand as well. Uh, long term, crushed coral can almost single-handedly prevent old tank syndrome where the pH crashes way down and nitrates get very high. We can't, it won't stop the nitrates, but it can stop the pH from just getting crashed way down. Um, so I do love that and it, it makes it great, especially for someone like me who has to travel a lot and maybe not keep my eye on one specific aquarium. I got to manage tons and tons and tons of aquariums. And so I need baselines to kind of stay where they want to go. And the thing to know about crushed coral is it does become exhausted eventually. Now, if your entire substrate is crushed coral, that might be in five, seven, eight years. You've got to replace it, maybe less, maybe more. depends on how many water changes you do. Where if we're only mixing in one pound per 10 gallons at the store, we find, and at home, we find that we have to replace it about once a year. And it's, it's well, we don't replace it. We just add to it. Because that's kind of one of the good things is crushed coral is, <laughs> Steen Fott's making me laugh. Uh, crushed coral is always dissolving, right? So eventually you would have nothing. In a long enough time, you would have nothing. Uh, but that would take a very long time. So usually you just keep adding a little bit more and more, you know, just to top it off, if you will. Now, crushed coral, it dissolves faster at the beginning, and then as it's been there, harder parts of the coral are left, so it takes longer to dissolve. So usually you get this like, oh, it's working this way, and then six months into it, it actually works slower, but still just as well. So, um, yeah, crushed coral, one of my absolute favorites. I incorporate it into almost every tank I 
you know, that's why it's like about the only thing I sell online as far as substrate goes. That would be crushed coral by the pound because we can't ship giant bags of it. it. Doesn't make any sense for us. But you know, I, I you know, I kind of make the statement like everyone should have an airstone in their aquarium. I almost well, let me think about that. I probably believe every aquarium should have some crushed coral because if your pH and hardness is already super high, the crushed coral isn't really going to dissolve. And if you ever like stop doing water changes, like let's say you became ill or you broke your leg or your arm and you couldn't work on your aquarium, even that crushed coral would still keep the pH high enough to not really run into a problem. So I might be able to make that statement if I would, I think I personally run in every single aquarium ever, but I don't know that I can say that every person has to, but Airstone, I do believe that. So let's say we move on from crushed coral because that's the love of my life to let's move on to plant substrates because people you know love to talk about plant substrates so let's break it down into what are we trying to accomplish with a plant substrate usually it's to deliver nutrients to the roots of plants and we do that a few different ways so one of the main ways that you know people would would mention would be plant soils and what does that mean soil think about it as like soil outside in your garden this is dirt right well, if we take just that dirt and we throw it in our aquarium, that's a mess. That's mud, right? So we have to contain it a little bit. And so what that means is if we take that dirt and we add some clay and we get the right mix just right, when we add it to our aquarium, it's not just a soupy mess. And so once the roots kind of grow into it and latch on to these little, you know, substrate balls that we have, they'll extract the nutrients. Okay, so knowing that the goal is to get nutrients to roots, soil is one of the best ways. That being said, because we've brought in this soil, with soil becomes, I don't want to call it contaminants because it's not, but just uh, organic material that wants to break down. Old leaves, you know, you're not going to see a leaf, but just the remnants of that breaking down uh, and that kind of stuff. It's going to, as that rots, it creates acids or ammonia. Well, it creates ammonia and then that breaks down and will actually acidify the water and it helps buffer your water down. One of the greatest things you can do if you're breeding crystal shrimp, again, oh, this animal needs this. If I use this substrate, it helps with that, right? And typically with shrimp, we also like plants. That becomes a real like, yeah, of course I'm gonna use that. That works great, okay? Now, we can also do it with some other ways, like something like an eco-complete, an active, active flora. Uh, I'm trying to think of other there's other substrates that have been like, I guess, impregnated with fertilizer, if you will, or have a high cation factor. And that is, you know, weird words to say. It's really good at soaking up uh, fertilizers. Another one that we used to use kind of, I say back in the day, but it's not that long ago, uh, would be uh, turfus. And turfus is made for like... Uh, like baseball fields and that kind of stuff where they need a lot of nutrients, that grass is taking a beating, right? And it's really made to soak up fertilizers. And so it does that really well. Well, it does that in our aquariums really well too, which is great, um, but very dirty, a lot of cleaning, might end in divorce. Ask my wife about that. I, I managed to like stain the bathtub and the walls black one time. It was a mess and a nightmare, but saved me some money at the time, learned a whole bunch. And that's, I still remember that. I learned a ton about using that. It was so light and fluffy because it was a clay-based product. I actually hated planting in it, but it worked, right? And kind of the same thing goes. A lot of these soil-based substrates are kind of lighter and fluffier, clay-based as well. And I'm going to lump in things like fluorite. They're, you know, it's a jagged, it's a jagged type substrate. It's higher in iron. It's got some nutrients, but it's not light and fluffy like... Uh, like the soil is, but it is still lighter and fluffier. Same with EcoComplete. And all of these are meant to help get nutrients down to plant roots. We can do that with you know fertilizers like root tabs and all that kind of stuff. Someone in, earlier was asking, how do I keep root tabs under the substrate when I'm using a light and fluffy substrate? I think they were using like EcoComplete, or not EcoComplete, but uh, like fluorite, right? So one of the things is you wanna plant that root tab all the way down to the bottom push it down until you hit glass and then typically that's why some of the um conventional wisdom in a planet tank is like 
two to three inches, you kind of want a thick substrate so the plant roots have uh, enough space to develop. But then also you can put any additives you want in that lower third. So if there were to travel up a little bit, they'd still be well uh, down in there. And that allows us as aquatic gardeners to be picking up plants and moving them and not just creating this you know, horrible mess all the time, which that is the biggest downfall from, for soil, like, like actual organic soil or dirt, is that typically the way that is set up, we're going to put a layer of dirt in, and then we're going to put a layer of something else. Some people say sand, which if we think about that, we talked about sand earlier cutting off um, oxygenation down to that lower level and bacteria, and it's not exactly a great environment for the roots, but it would have a lot of uh, nutrients. So you will get decent plant growth out of it, but I personally, I've run a, you know, back Back in my day, when I was just a hobbyist, which was, you know, I was thinking about that the other day, that's like 15 years ago now. It's, it's a crazy thing for me to think about, but like 15 years ago, when I had, um, you know, dirt, and I tried it with sand, I got X result, right? But then I tried it with normal gravel, like just normal aquarium gravel. I actually got way better growth using normal, just like tan colored gravel, because I got better water circulation, I got more oxygen down in there, and it worked better for me personally. Now, you know, I've, I haven't done more than probably 20 or 30 dirty tanks in my life, so I don't want to say like, oh, I've set up and I've run all the experiments, but that worked very well for me. The big problem you find with sand or with uh, dirt is whenever you go to move a plant, it's going to bring some of that dirt with it, right? And invariably that kind of mucks it up and now it's sitting, we talked about that, lighter, fluffier things sitting on top of heavier things, right? But eventually it will work its way back down. So if this is the gravel and this is the dirt, eventually it kind of goes through and will settle back down. This takes maybe a month or two. So dirt I find works really well in tanks where you know you're not gonna be moving much stuff around. You don't have fish that are digging a whole bunch and you're willing to deal with the excess nutrients and again, You'll see that kind of in a video coming up of a fish room tour I did. It is very, very nutrient rich. And so we need a lot of plants. We might have to do a lot of water changes until it calms down and we soaked up enough so that we can actually utilize it. And we get that same problem in a lot of the, uh, the plant substrates, whether it's ADA soil, um, full and that kind of stuff. We can get, it's so nutrient dense, releasing ammonia. And if we're not careful, we can actually hurt our fish or our, uh, our shrimp and things like that. So, you know, that's why we might have to cycle the substrate sometimes and that, that would be on the negative effect on it, but you do get the positive. And one thing I don't think is talked about enough when it comes to, let's say dirt and soils, like, or, or just like, you know, ADA soils, that kind of stuff is every substrate kind of runs out. And so, except for like an inert thing, cause you're not asking for it to do anything. If you say, don't do anything, and it doesn't do anything, well then it's doing nothing forever. But things we're asking it to do, whether it's crushed coral to raise pH, whether it's uh, soil to provide nutrients, eventually it gets exhausted. And a lot of times that's around that two year mark on a lot of them. Now if you crank it up and you go out like miles of soil, it's gonna take a lot longer, right? But you're also gonna have a lot more nutrients leaching into the water. You're gonna have uh, you know, a lot of space taken up in the aquarium. I personally found the best mix for dirt when I used it was about half an inch or less of dirt and then two solid inches of gravel, maybe even two and a half inches. So that way the roots would grow, 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 and then eventually it hit the bottom and boom, that plant would just explode. And then whenever you pulled it out, barely any dirt to deal with. It was great. Um, and I find most of us, uh, we probably end up rescaping a tank within the next two, three, four years anyway. And so that might not be a problem uh, with, you know, your substrate and that kind of stuff. You're going, oh, okay, yeah, I'll just swap it out. Do know that I haven't talked to anything about pricing, but, uh, you know, ADA soil, fluval stratum, a lot of these plant substrates can be very expensive. General rock can be very cheap. Sand can be very cheap. Crushed coral can be in the middle, roughly. And there's always that good deal, like, oh, I got a good deal factor, you know, chime that in as you see fit. Uh, but that being said, I have seen plenty of great planted tanks grown without using special substrates. 
I've seen plenty of great tanks grown using them and I, I don't want people to forget, you should be factoring in what your water is. If your water is very, very high pH and hardness, using a soil is gonna help bring that down to the water parameters that one, the fish, but two, the plants are gonna enjoy growing in more. If you're already down where Cory is, putting in soil brings it even lower and that's a bad thing. So we actually, if I wanna use soil, I have to almost do equal parts of soil and equal parts of crushed coral just so that it levels out and doesn't just crash me down. So we've covered gravel, we've covered sand, we've covered a lot of the uh, soil type planted products. I mean, there's always gonna be more. There's what about this, what about that? But that's what we're thinking about when we think about planted substrates, right? So let's move on to what do I have next here? I'm trying to remember all the things I, I talked about. Ooh, let's start talking about some things like um, crushed lava rock. Now that's an interesting one that I like, and I, I always mean to do a tank about it with it, but I haven't. And it would be using kind of lava rock that's that big as your substrate, and then using like bigger lava rocks as your hardscape looks really cool, right? Uh, in that scenario, you're going to get a ton of bacteria growth because of all the pores on this uh, on this type of rock, right? Now, that reason I want to talk about that is it leads me to talk about your gravel that you choose is one of your best filters in your aquarium. Uh, just the surface area is very large, right? And water is going to be touching it all the time, and it's surface area for bacteria to grow. And so it's one of the best ones we're ever going to have. And so something like uh, lava rock or akadama rock from ADA or bonsai or bonsai, uh, very porous and will give us a lot and a lot, a lot of bacteria, which could be a great thing. It's also pretty sharp though. So maybe it's not the greatest for fish that want to dig all the time and that kind of stuff. But it is great for doing uh, biological stuff. You know, if you had a big African cichlid tank and you mixed that crushed lava rock with uh, crushed coral, you might have a pretty slick looking mix, about the same weight. You can get uh, lava rock that's in black or in red. You got a couple different colors to choose from. It's all natural. You don't have to worry about, is this gonna you know, give off some uh, you know, something? I mean, technically lava rock can bring in a little bit of uh, pH altering minerals, but uh, not too much from my experience. Not much more than we're changing water for. And I think it's understated often that your gravel or your substrate is very, very important to the overall health of your aquarium. If you have a very healthy substrate, it's got a lot of bacteria, maybe it's got worms in it, planaria, maybe it's got um, you know, good aeration, that says a lot to how well that aquarium is gonna do. That's nature's filter is basically that layer, it just breaks stuff down, right? And so we want that to be very healthy. And when we start getting unhealthy ones, maybe we're seeing a lot of blue-green algae or cyanobacteria kind of up on the glass where light hits it, right? Maybe we're seeing some gas pockets form. A lot of times you can see that under sand, especially in saltwater tanks over time, you can see sand pockets or gas pockets, which means like some sulfide gas. And it doesn't mean that that's going to kill your fish or anything like that, but it is a sign. It would be like looking at me and going, hey, you're overweight. Clearly, that's not optimal, right? I'm not going to die tomorrow. But like, oh, I know that's not nearly as good if he was really in shape, right? So that's how I look at substrate going, oh, it, yeah, I don't know. And if I was to see uh, some ADA soil or something like that breaking down, it's not holding the ball shape anymore, and it's just being held, you know, it's like, it's flat and more like mud. I know like, well, that's, you know, we're, we're waiting until that kind of crashes at some point, unless we're doing something to actively uh, prevent that, right? All right, what else do I want to talk about with substrate? Um, i trying to think. So people were asking about uh, uh, black, black diamond blasting sand. My brain isn't thinking, I know that's, it's a slightly variation of how you say those words. Uh, but what I find about that, it's very cheap and it's black. So people like black substrate and they like cheap. But I find that because it's so jagged, it compacts really hard, right? So either A, you're gonna get the sand, it's very fine sand, that already compacts, or B, you're gonna get the coarser stuff and that compacts also. So I don't like it for planted tanks and I don't like it for um, 
things are going to really, really, really want to dig a lot. Besides that, yeah, it's a black substrate. Use it. It would be fine. You know, if you just want, you know, if you want an arowana, you've got some blood parrots, and you've got black diamond sand on the bottom, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that at all, right? But if you've got uh, maybe goldfish that might be getting microabrasions in their mouth and they're constantly mouthing it, um, you know, that could be a problem. Oscars and other cichlids that they pick it up and they spit it back out. It's still a small enough grain to get sucked into filters. That could be a problem. But the reason why it's so popular is because it is black and it's very, very cheap. And so that's a winning combination. And I can't fault that. You know, if, if the budget, you know, if the parameters, so let's say you've got water parameters, you've got fish, you've got budget, and you've got look, if those are all equal and you've got limited money, then that substrate really makes a lot of sense. Right, so I would go with it if I really had to, but if I had extra income, I would probably choose a different substrate that might be uh, more well-rounded, so to speak, going forward. And a lot of that stuff, a lot of these you know gravels and inert things, you can use for many, many years, 20, 30 tanks, or 20, I was reading as I was talking, 20, 30 years, uh, whereas something that is reactionary, you might only get five or six most, right? Someone was asking, what about bare bottom tanks? And we were talking earlier about uh, bare bottom tanks, reflections could be hard on fish. We also, uh, the surface area on glass is much, much lower than the porosity of any type of substrate. So you're gonna lose quite a bit of the bacterial load there. Um, you also have other effects like filtration. Uh, so as you have rocks, right, uh, it slows down flow, just like putting in bushes and trees and all that kind of stuff slows down wind without that it just whips through there way too fast and that can be problematic as well so uh i'm not saying that i'm against uh bare bottom tanks but do know they run differently than a substrate tank i myself i'm a fan of bare bottom tanks because of ease of maintenance and there's a few things you can do with it and sometimes it looks like the best thing I've ever seen. It's also sometimes like, ah, oh, geez, like, ah, uh, that one doesn't look so good, right? And we can use things like tiles and other stuff to like maybe dress up the bare bottom look and not get the reflection. There's plenty of ways to play with all of this. Um, yeah, but I wouldn't be so afraid of substrates. A lot of times goldfish people are afraid, Corydoras, I was, I was gonna address that. And if, if I hadn't have been so busy today, uh, I was gonna get that clip ready, but I've shown it in the Peru videos that at least where I was collecting Corydoras, they were in very abrasive substrate and it wasn't just a fine sand. I'm not saying that you won't find Corydoras in fine sand, but I also don't think it's fair to say Corydoras can only live in sand versus uh, they can't live in rocks, right? I believe, you know, as long as we're not making them find their food way deep in a very sharp substrate, you know, if I had to you know, bob for an apple in glass, that's a problem, right? But if it's like, oh, the apple sits on the table above the bucket full of glass, I'll just eat that, right? So that's kind of the way we can, you know, manage expectations with our fish and the substrate. Like, don't force them. Like, if we had a an ONIP tab on the glass, right? It's on there. If it just dissolves and falls into very sharp gravel and gets down in there, they're gonna be they're gonna want to dig in and get it. But if it is falling down, they're eating it right off the top, that's not really a problem. Or fish are eating it, you know, so think about it, like, oh, an ONIP tab might not be great to feed your Corydoras compared to uh, like a Rapashi food or frozen blood worms or something like that. It's gonna stay topical on that substrate. So uh, I wanted to read one because I I don't want to leave, I want to try to leave no substrate unturned. Uh, what do I think about the Lucas Brett style using mulm as it naturally builds up as a primary top substrate over time? I know it's messy, but it does work well, does it work well in my opinion? So, this gets down to different layers of substrate. Now, let's talk about just the mulm. And what mulm is, is is, 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 is. Fish poop, snail poop, broken down stuff by bacteria. It's the lightest and fluffiest stuff. It's what you kind of clear out of your filters, you know, when, you, when you've got brown water, 
it's kind of that, right? So you've got this layer of that. Now, inherently, I'm convinced it is in no way detrimental to an aquarium, right? So I, I, I don't believe it hurts. I do believe it is slightly beneficial in that it's a great place for fry, you know, very tiny fish to eat from. It's a great place to harbor uh, different little crustaceans, copepods, and that kind of stuff. But as a substrate, in the context we've been talking about so far in this show, it would be horrible for rooting a plant if you want to root if you only had that, right? Uh, and it would be easy to waft up in. So, like in Lucas Brent's case, a lot of times he's got either a lot of separation between the fish and that substrate, that mulm layer, or B, he's got very small fish that don't just waft it up all the time. But in, let's say you had very big fish, like I say, a lot of goldfish, you had a layer of mulm. I think you'd see your water continually being cloudy. And again, I don't necessarily think that would be uh, detrimental other than our viewing experience, right? So I feel like mulm itself is good and I myself don't focus on making sure I get rid of it. In fact, I like to leave a little bit in there, but I don't know that I would encourage the average person because if someone just has you know, white gravel, which, oh, don't buy white gravel. I, should, I was with someone I was gonna talk about. It. I remember that from last week. So white gravel and black gravel, you know, we talked about the fish poop and that kind of stuff. Uh, do know that colors of gravel can make a little bit of a difference, right? So we know that if we're outside and we're wearing a black shirt, obviously it's gray, not black, but if we're wearing a black shirt, more heat gets absorbed, right? Lighting kind of gets absorbed by black. Whereas white tends to reflect. And that's where a lot of times you can have, uh, let's say you had a tank that was 50-50 black and white, which I've seen that done or I've seen pathways made and that kind of stuff. The white itself will get uh, very, very algae. So one, it's really reflecting that light and it's getting a disproportionate amount of like light on it. Two, because it's white, any green that grows on it really looks green, whereas green growing on black doesn't look very green. And so color can play a big part. And I, I do focus when I'm putting an aquarium together, I think, okay, when algae grows, because algae is gonna grow at some point, whether it's at the beginning, whether it's on Christmas break and you were lazy or just something got out of balance, like, is this gonna stand out horribly or will it mesh in? And I think about fish poop also, I know that's gonna be a constant thing going. And so whether the algae is brown or green, I usually like it to kind of blend in. Black does okay at that. Browns do really well at that, you know. And how I typically think about that is, or if I was in the store and I was talking to people and they were really trying to like, oh, I don't know, man, I don't know. I would say like, well, I don't know that I've ever seen a piece of wood in an aquarium that actually looks bad, right? It's brown, maybe it's got some diatom allergy, you barely even notice. Oh, it's got some green allergy, you barely even notice. And in fact, if it's got tons of green algae, it actually looks cool. And then if, you, oh, it's covered in black beard algae, even that looks kind of cool. So somehow those real neutral, natural tones hide everything really well, but it also, I think, just looks natural. Somehow, I think our brain just goes, ooh, that looks nature-y, right? And uh, in general, it looks good. Whereas if you have SpongeBob, which don't get me wrong, I love SpongeBob, but if he looks like he's covered in algae, you're going, oh, yikes, right? So... Yeah. All right, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit. See if I can catch up with, um, oh, I guess I should weigh in on gravel vacuuming and not gravel vacuuming. Someone said, I've never gravel vacked any of my tanks in eight years. Yes, uh, I do think there's two ways to go about this. There is gravel vac routinely. And so what I mean by routinely is like, oh, I do it every month or every three months, like something where it's like, it makes sense, right? or don't do it at all. That would be what nature does. Nature goes, oh, I don't gravel vac, right? But if you like neglect it for three years, then you go and gravel vac, you can disrupt so much stuff, it could actually be worse than doing nothing. And uh, I personally in planted tanks don't do any gravel vacuuming. I let those nutrients kind of soak down in and, and as we know, mulm and that kind of stuff, it's a lighter stuff, it's eventually gonna go in, right? Assuming you don't have a very, uh, compact substrate layer sand or really jagged gravel that locks in and won't let stuff go through it uh, but eventually it settles in as long as you're having um you know mulm production is slower than it's being consumed like you don't need this much mulm in a tank right like that's bad so 
Um, but yeah, I, I think there's two camps to go there. And I think invariably, like, even if I'm not gravel backing, usually I'm changing some water or at least I'm managing water parameters. And I believe that I would never set up a brand new hobbyist and say, you should never touch your substrate ever. And you should just let the tank do what it's going to do. Instead, it's like, well, we probably need to gravel vac because you've never fed fish before. You're likely to overdo it. And we should monitor water because we need to learn how water works. And then, no, you're, you're year four in keeping it and you haven't done a gravel vac in two years. Great. You've leveled up, basically. Like, you've learned. And we've gotten you through, you know, healing fish and learning all those things. So, yeah. The internet says that too much mulm causes corridors to get sick. Mulm is okay versus, oh, Cory versus internet. Uh, so again, I can only speak to my personal breeding of corridoras and then also me going and seeing them like in the wild, right? Some of the places where they are, the mulm is this thick. And I know that because I step into it and it goes past your knee and then it's like a hot tub's going on with all the sulfite gas bubbling up. Right? And so I don't inherently believe that just mulm is bad. Now, I could, you could convince me that in the instance where you had high levels of mulm buildup, in the average aquarist, possibly that water was very bad for corridors and they were more subject to getting sick. I could believe that. But like at L.R. Brett's fish room, where he's still doing water changes, he's doing all these things, and he had that mulm, I don't think that's the same as... My kid had a tank in his bedroom. We didn't do anything to it for four years. And one day the Corydoras died. Like that's clearly different. But we would lump that together kind of on the internet most times. Like, oh, well, a thing happened one time and then I read about a thing that did a thing and therefore that thing is now a law. And I'm not saying that I am right because I have not done nearly enough studying to prove or disprove this. I can only say in my own fish room, here's what I've noticed. In the wild, here's what I've noticed. I can't say, here's what the studies I've run have found, here's the studies I've read have found, none of that. Um, I can say, that's what I've read on the internet, you know, and I would agree with you that most people say that would be bad. I'm not convinced it is bad. Other hobbyists, like Greg Sage, you know, he runs a business selling fish, he thinks mulm is very detrimental. I myself love it. And he says that some of his fish don't thrive when there's mulm. I've bought his fish, and they thrived with me having mulm. Um, that being said, he keeps other fish that I've never kept and maybe I would never be able to keep. I think there's multiple ways to do this and I think water parameters come into play. I think a lot of things come into play. All right. How many people do we got? Maybe we'll check in on Super Chats now that we're halfway into the show. We got 993 was the peak. Oh man, we got seven grandmas in the house that are logging in another laptop. Let's do that. Laptop, iPad. Let's break a hundred or a thousand. Uh, this is the point where I'm supposed to ask you to subscribe because uh, no one subscribes anymore. We know that almost 70% of you that will watch this never make an account on YouTube. And why would you make an account? The only reason would be if you want to get notified when I go live, when new videos come out, if you want to help this number get bigger that allows me to strong arm more companies to change products. Yeah, you know, that's, that's mostly what you can do. Oh, do I have that? Let me let me hit the 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 thingy. So this is how you subscribe, and this is how you turn the notifications on. Let's see if I can do it. There we go. Yeah. So by actually hitting that bell, I think a lot of people have heard it a billion times from a billion creators. I believe that to be true. Uh, what it actually does when you hit that bell, basically you're telling YouTube, "Let me know when Corey puts out a new video." or a community post. If you don't hit that bell, then YouTube will go, you know, they didn't watch Corey's unboxing on Sunday, so even though he released the coolest tour of this thing ever in the world, yeah, maybe they're just done with Corey. That's, they're, they're deciding for you based on your viewing habits, right? So, you know, you can make that conscious effort. You have to have an account to do that. And uh, the other thing is, even though we've got, and I, I can look at the analytics, we've got like 55,000 people or something like that that have clicked that bell out of 325,000 almost. Uh, only about 20,000 of you have notifications on. So what does that mean? It 
means you have to actually go to your phone and be like, oh, let YouTube send me notifications. And what that means is when you click the bell for a creator, whether it's me or not, then you'll get a little thing on your phone. You can turn off so it doesn't make sounds or anything like that. It just has a thing like, oh, oh yeah, Scene Fight Aquatics did release a video. And if I want to watch that, I watch that. You can also set up to get it through email, but that's my job. My job is to get you guys subscribed because as when we talk to YouTube, YouTube base says like, you guys are doing great, but no one subscribes to you. Or not no one, but disproportionately, not enough people are subscribing. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's all I got. We did restock a ton of items. So we restocked Phoenix lights that we were out of forever and a day because they were out forever and a day and our reserves couldn't carry us through that, them being out for like five months. Uh, we brought in, we were stocked up on Seru stone, dragon stone, pre-filter sponges. Yeah, that was a brand new product. Let me go grab my new, I was too rushed today. I had a whole brand new product to show you guys today. I'm gonna grab it, I'm gonna find it. Found it. Found it. All right. So, with all that stuff that came in, we only brought in one new product. Uh, that's because it takes a while to develop products. This one would be the nano sponge or mini sponge as we sell it, right? But now it, I got an eyelash on my eye. I think we're going to have to amputate. Get rid of that eye. All right. Uh, so this sponge is coarser. It's not as coarse as like our medium sponge or large sponge, but it's definitely not super fine like the normal mini intake we were selling. So it is this right here. If it hide my face, hide it. How does it never focus on this? Oh, I think because we set it to, hold on. It's because it was set for Dean, that's why. It's Dean's fault. Let me change focus. Ah, I changed it. Now will it do it? Changing, come on, come on. There we go. Yeah, so you can see kind of the coarseness of it. And uh, so yeah, it's gonna work really well for your little shrimp tanks, your little nano tanks, little beta tanks, because it won't get super clogged up super fast. With the fine one, they were super fine, they got clogged up really fast, and that was kind of a problem. I think we sell these things like two bucks, and uh, don't worry, there are new products on the way, but uh, they still have not hit the water. No, no matter how hard I ask, and I go, please, please, we've given you our money, send them, please. Like, uh, we're waiting on spider wood. Sorry. We have the big pieces, but the nano packs, uh, they're claiming that there's been way too much rains and that kind of stuff, so they actually can't prep them, which I'm like, ah, oh, geez, okay, well, so that... It's like a 15 day delay so far and we're waiting for the rainy season to be, I don't know if we're waiting for it to be done, but enough dry days to get our stuff prepped. So uh, yeah, things are definitely in the works. Wow, some activity has been happening on the super chat front. We've got some new members, 54 Punchy, Tammy, Ben, B-E-H-N, Ben. And also Genevieve Celestial Eklund has joined the team. Thank you guys very much. $5 every month goes towards making me awesome, or at least funding what we do, whether it's flying around, whether it's mostly flying around. That's what we do is we fly around and we bring you cool stuff. And you also get custom emojis and you get, any of you that are members have been watching the secret project that has been taking all of my time. And as you can see here, people are commenting, Corey looks tired. Secret project is a lot of work for Corey. So uh, yes, I've been burning the candle at four different ends at this point. And, uh, yeah, so if you are a member, you get to kind of see that. If you're not a member, you'll get to see it maybe in a month or two, right? And you'll be like, oh, that was the thing he was talking about. Cool. The Fish Tank Barns donated a $5. What is your opinion on Home Depot gravel? I've used it in many of my tanks with plants, and I have a great luck with plants. Yeah. Uh, so it's a coarser pea gravel. And... I, I kind of went over this when I visited someone's house was using it. And so there's a fish room tour coming up. You're going to hear more about it. But it will grow plants nice and coarse, which is good. Uh, what it doesn't do is it doesn't gravel vac very easy. Because it's so coarse, getting the gravel vac to go down on it, you got to work it again. Uh, that being said, it's cheap. It's like five bucks a bag. 
but you do got to rinse it a lot and it'll make some muddy water. But the reality is we're comparing rocks to rocks and it's like, mm, it, it's rocks, like it'll work. You know, if it's a rounded rock, it pretty much works. Loose statement. Jester's Aquarium says, hit that like button and don't forget to hit that like button. And he always misses my live streams. Yes, uh, because I don't know if you guys saw on the community page, which if you guys aren't following my community page, you should because I post there every single day pretty much. And so that means you're missing something that we're doing every single day. And yes, you could probably only get it on your phone or your iPad or you have to physically go and click, you know, Aquarium Co-op on YouTube and then you have to click community page. It's like it's, it's a few clicks in otherwise, right? Uh, but... We're hanging out there, we're doing polls, we're doing uh, behind the, well, not really behind the scenes unless you remember, but pictures, we're doing videos, all kinds of stuff happening there. This is seriously a problem with his eyelash. All right. Hello from Brazil. I got to get out to Brazil still, so. I haven't supported the coop in a long time. Mile High Plecos, well, thank you very much, Mile High Plecos. I've watched you support a lot of other creators, and I know everyone is thankful for it. I know I'm always appreciative of it, and uh, yeah, all I can do is reinvest to make bigger and better things happen. Uh, I guess I, I don't know if I have an announcement, I already say it. Officially so far, I speak at uh, the Aquatic Experience on Saturday, and I will be giving a retailer talk, and I believe the talk is named, and I say I believe because I've, I've only written the talk out like twice, is how to actually connect with people on social media. So I feel that most businesses, they do social media, but they do it so terribly and so robotic that they never actually make a connection with you guys like I'm trying to do here or have done here. And I wanna teach other businesses, so if you're you know, if you're a good business, it's like, and they just do like, oh, social media is not working. It's like, you have to be genuine, you have to actually care, right? You have to actually wanna build a connection there. And we'll talk all about that. I think it's like an hour long. And from what I was told, the general public can attend. So you don't have to be just in the trade to be able to attend that talk uh, on that Saturday. We have not, they have not lined up the other talks yet. So there's still a chance I would give another talk, maybe same day uh, or different day. I'm not sure. And that would be like a, like a talk maybe like this or something, you know, some kind of Q&A with maybe I went on a trip or whatever that is. I give talks. That's what I do. So, um... I have detritus worms, and I do a one-third water change and gravel back. What would you do? Tiger barbs, rams, horn snails, plants, an eight-week-old aquarium. Uh, Della, I wouldn't do anything. I So, you know, call me crazy. I'm not a person that thinks planaria or detritus worms are very detrimental to my aquarium. I find them to be like, yeah, they just live there. Kind of like worms or something like that. I was like, yeah, they're there. You know, like in my garden. Yeah, they're fine. And I would say, like, if you were worried about it, usually they're the result of too much waste in an aquarium. So it could be we're feeding too much. could mean that we don't have enough snails to really break down the waste. But I think a normal amount is healthy, right? So I look in and I see stuff crawling through that substrate. I'm like, yeah, that's a healthy ecosystem they got going on there. Where if you were to, like, nuke it and get rid of them all, I'm like, that's less healthy. Or if you had four billion of them, I'd be like, that's less healthy also. So I think a, a moderate amount, same for snails, that kind of stuff, it leads to this is a balanced system. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for balance. We're not looking for any one parameter, any one fish or anything to start dominating, just getting way out of control in any one direction. We just want this nice, like, oh, yeah, it's cohabitation. That's what we're looking for. All right. Contrast, New York. I love your videos, especially the recent Jack Watley tour. Yes, uh, Jack Watley, or not Jack Watley, Gabe of Jack, Wa Jack, Wa Jack Watley Discus. Uh, very animated person, cool to hang out with. Wish I had had more time, but we had other stops to hit that day. And uh, I will say this, it was crazy hot in that, uh, in that fish room. Like really hot. And there was mosquitoes <laughs> inside. So it was, it was like filming outside. It was real hot that day. Um, yeah, I think one of the cameras overheated, so I had to swap that kind of stuff. But no, that's, you know, flew down to Florida and Wild Fish Tanks helped me get that connection, make that happen. And that's kind of what the whole membership and where I spend your guys' money that you buy products from us with. And that is flying down to Florida, something like that video. 
I think on that weekend I only made that video. I mean, I made a couple other stuff and I didn't really, I ended up letting Wild Fish Tanks have it because it wasn't that, like, it wasn't enough. And so something like that video cost me uh, roughly about $1,000 to make. You know, and that's if, you know, that's just plane tickets and that kind of stuff. Not That doesn't include, like, well, you didn't, you didn't work for four days because you, you only made one video and you did, like, nothing else. So, you know, it can be pretty costly to do that stuff, but that's where when you guys are pitching in, that's where I'm like, even though I'm not working, you guys are covering that. So it's like, okay, you guys are paying me to go do that. I'll bring you the goods. Hopefully I do a good job and we hope for the best. Best ways to layer the substrate on a taco. Ooh, the fishy mailman. About to get educated. So we start with our crispy tortilla shell, right? And we typically go for the wide mouth ones because those ones that come to a point, they just snap right when you take your first bite. We want these to snap on the third or fourth bite because then we've got just enough to ah, eat the whole thing, right? So the first thing you do is you take that shell and then you ask your wife, hey, will you make this? And if she won't do it, then I got to do it because my wife is very nice to me and she will typically make tacos for me. But if I'm in dire straits and I have to make my own taco, we have learned that the first thing to go down is either guacamole or sour cream. When you layer the taco with that, you then have a substrate in which everything else will stick to. So then I go with one of those. Then I go with the ground beef, ground taco beef. Then I hit it with the cheese. Maybe you're into the lettuce. Maybe you're into cilantro. Maybe you're into uh, onions. That's the same spot, you know. So we've got our substrate down. We've got our fixings on. Then we're going to cap it off with another substrate. That's where I hit it with either the guac or the sour cream because that is the shield that's going to keep that bound together. As you bite down, that sour cream or guacamole on the top will attach to the sides of that taco and keep it from just overfilling and running down your face while you're the life of the party. So if you can get three or four bites in before that thing breaks loose, you can leave dinner without a taco on your shirt. So that, my friend, is how you do substrates on tacos. 65 gallon okay for a single flower horn, Dan? Yes, for a very long time or as long as you take care of it well. Uh, I believe you can shoehorn one, shoehorn a flower horn into a 40 breeder, uh, which case a 65 is usually an upgraded version of that. That's a taller version if you got the 65, 55. That's right, say that two times fast, 65.55, which is a 55 gallon, it's a little bit taller, 65 gallon. Uh, in that instance, you might have to upgrade a little sooner because you don't have that front to back depth to really let that flower horn develop and turn around. So, Daniel McCoy, $10 super chat. Thanks for all you do. Sorry, life has been overwhelming. Well, I think you work for yourself, Daniel, and uh, I definitely know how that goes. There's weeks where I don't even get to live stream. It's like, you know what? It's just, I just not enough time. You know, like after this, uh, what, what's 610 right now, right? At seven o'clock, we'll be done and I'm going to pile into the car and my wife is going to do paperwork while, and ask me questions while we drive to the airport to pick up 21 boxes of plants and then I'm going to drive that back to the warehouse. So that's our night. Woo, looks fun, right? Wednesday night. Uh, but definitely our life has been a little crazy even though we're taking it slow and I'm not traveling. Uh, secret project has led to uh, lots of work. So, did we get seven more iPad people uh, on this train yet? I'm not even on the right screen. Hold on. Hold on. That's the wrong, all the wrong screens and all the wrong places. 993 still, we're never going to get there. Even after a taco substrate explanation. That better make it to the aquarium clips, Jimmy. If you're if you're watching this, taco substrate. I can't release that. That's too. No one will ever want to watch that. Don't don't make that into a clip because then it'll be a clip that never gets released. Uh, Jacob White says I was listening to the old real fish talk and heard legend of a young scene Corey with pierced lips, pink hair. Uh, will we ever get to see pictures of this? I would imagine so. Hold on. Do I have the picture show set up? No, I can't do that on the fly. I might be able to do that. If I can remember, we might be able to set that up sometime in the future because I think there's one hidden on a, uh, like a picture hidden on a, a photo bucket account. 
that I might be able to pull up. But I'm sure my wife's got plenty of pictures and we could have some uh, some like, whoa, Corey, you've come a long way type of live stream. Russell Mullis, you're my hero? Well, I'm flattered if that's a true statement. Otherwise, uh, I guess there's no otherwise. But if that's true, I'm, I'm glad to be an influence on someone in a positive way. All right, back to the normal chat. We've made it through all the super chats. Owen Wilson, it's 2 a.m. there? It's only 6 here, so 6 p.m. Yes. Uh, do I have a twig catfish video? Hmm. I don't have... So, I don't have a video of me doing it, but I have an entire one-hour presentation on, on uh, whiptail species catfish that is on the channel. I will say that is one of the most underutilized features of YouTube. I don't think many people know that if you go to the Aquarium Co-op channel, there's a big search glass there, right? Not at the top. Come down low next to like, oh, playlist, all those other things, right there, right? Boom. Click on that, and if you were to type in Whiptail, it would probably come up. Like, at this point, we're like 870 videos. Someone earlier on the community page was like, you should do a video on on brine shrimp, setting up a brine shrimp hatchery. I was like, actually, I've done two already. Here's this link and this link. Uh, but there's so many things we have covered uh, that a lot of times it's already done, you know. So look there first because not that the quality is always the best like it would be today. I mean, I look dang good today. I'm in high definition. But, you know, the information is still the same. So, yeah. Laterite, beneficial or waste of money? Hmm. I myself have never fully explored laterite. So half of me tends to, well, can't be that important if I've never used it. The other half of me is like, because I've never used it, I can't say it's not important. But I've never, you know, used any of the laterite supplements or anything like that to doctor my substrate. Um, so inherently, though, from what I've seen on laterite prices, it seems extraordinarily expensive for like a little bit of plant magic you know so I, I i hesitate towards saying that's a good investment but if you had unlimited funny funny money funds what i was gonna say not funny if you had unlimited money funds go ahead and throw some in you got nothing to lose on that you know but if you're like well it's either some laterite additives or a different fertilizer buy the fertilizer so all right, Russell with another $5 super chat. Boom, keep up the awesome work. I will try for at least another four to five minutes. I felt good today, I felt good. Want to do the live stream, not always do I want to do the live stream. Sometimes I know like walking out here, I was like, today's gonna be a good day, today's a good live stream. I'm in the mood to do a live stream. Uh, let's see. At anyone here, do you go to the website to leave reviews? Uh, if you need to leave a review, all you gotta do is go to our website. If you bought from us, uh, you can go down the page. There'll be all the reviews section. You can click there and leave a verified review. I think we only allow verified reviews because we don't do that. We get a lot of people that, uh, or not a lot of people, but you know, porn spam links and all that kind of stuff. And it was, there is some legitimate people that wanna leave a review that uh, have not bought from us, but with that comes all of that other spammy stuff that we have to really sort through. And it's unfortunately one of those like, for every legitimate person that wants to leave a review, there's 7,000 buy my webinar or porn link or something like that. So we just, yeah, we don't do it. But you can leave us reviews, uh, whether you've ever bought from us or not, um, on Facebook and Google and Yelp, uh, you know, hopefully you have bought from us, um, but, or a friend has something like that. Cause we don't really, you know, it doesn't really help someone like I've never bought from him, but he's cool. Like, yes, uh, that is true. I'm very cool, but people are usually looking at reviews for, have you bought? What was your experience? What can I expect out of it? And as cool as I am, if we don't do something right, that doesn't really help you. So. How are our dogs doing? Our dogs are doing pretty good. Sassy's getting very old and she's getting very crotchety. She spends a lot of time growling like a bear at stuff. Sometimes she does like the wall, not necessarily the wall, but you know, she just is 
angry and old. Um, but I bought a few new foods, got some new dog treats, or as I've been calling them, dad treats, because only I'm allowed to give them just because I bought them. And, uh, you know, spoiling them rotten and enjoying them. But, yeah, hoping that some of the new additives and stuff will... I think she's got some stiffness in the joints, which she's had that for a long time. She's an old dog, but hopefully, like, oh, yeah, this is the right blend. Just, you know, just got an old pep in the step back. So, yeah. I didn't get asked after the last purchase to review products. Uh, the website's gone through some different apps and iterations. So, depending on when you bought, there could have been, oh, that app was responsible for, like, sending you an email, but then we discontinued using that app. Uh, or I did extend the period in which uh, it goes to ask to the review. So it used to be like 10 days, and now I think it might be at like 21 days. I basically wanted to give more time for people to utilize a product or something like that before they gave an opinion. And so, or this system is completely broken and has not sent any to you, Brian, and I have no idea why it's doing that. So it could be any of those scenarios, but I would wager it's one of the first two of like, oh, yeah, some settings, or he changed it, and that's what happened, so... Sean is approaching the one year anniversary of his fish tank and have had a lot of success thanks, success thanks to my videos. Well, good. That is great. Today is actually the four year anniversary of us getting in this house, which is crazy because it seems like way long time ago with the amount, like just the different fish room builds and stuff we've done in only four years. I, f I feel like we've lived 10 years of a normal life in four years because it just, you know, Joel and I were, you know, Corvus Oscar and I were talking about that just the other day, like, wait. When Jimmy, Joel, and I were in Vegas, that was last year, and it was like two days ago. And we're like, that was only a year ago? We were at Super Zoo? What? Like, we've done so much since that. So it's crazy. Uh, word on the street is you are interested on in giving yearly presentation at, <laughs> oh good, at the Scape Club. I hope it's true, uh, because I definitely would like to meet you in person to understand the hate on the cancer filter. Oh, I can, I can debate anyone to death. Um, what you'll find in person is that I'm the same person. So, I mean, people think I hate cancer filters. No, I just think that someone has to say, stop buying cancer filters like they're going to fix your life. They do nothing for walking your dog. They do nothing for the oil leak on your car. They do nothing for your fish, essentially. It's not they do nothing. It's that most of your gravel and the filtration you already have is already in 400% excess of what you need, that that extra cancer filter is not the answer. The, the, you know, the $100, the $200, whatever it was, was better spent on any other aspect of your hobby. It was even better on walking your dog or changing your oil or fixing that oil leak. Like fixing that oil leak in a roundabout way will have a bigger impact on that aquarium than uh, putting the cancer filter on for most people. I bit my tongue, most people. Uh, that being said, there are very, very select instances where I find cancer filters appropriate. And if that's, I would say that's 10% of the way people actually use them. So a lot of people go, but I like it. I would, I would make the same argument for trucks. I, I wager that only one out of 10 people that owns a truck in America needs a truck. I, I would even back that up with, I'm a guy that owns a minivan. And even I'm on the cusp of, you know, you may not need that minivan. Even though I use it to move, you know, a bunch of lights today. I'm using it to go to the airport again today. But, you know, in general, we like to buy things that are new and shiny and awesome and not so much out of sheer necessity. You know, you go to some other... I, I promise you if I was in Peru, the amount of stuff I moved from uh, one location to another today, they would have had on the back of a motorcycle. Like, I've seen some crazy stuff go down in Peru. So... Uh, it is, I'm able to afford that, not needed, and uh, my hate on cannabis filters is the same hate. I don't think most people need a truck. I'm not even sure I need, the word is need, a bigger vehicle to move all the stuff I move. Uh, so yeah. But no, uh, back to the yearly presentation at the Scape Club. I'm not sure that I've committed to a yearly presentation. I do know that I've committed to, hey, I would like to sponsor your club. I could... Uh, fly down there and give a presentation. I have gone through that much with the Scape Club. I don't know that I've committed to a yearly thing yet, though. We'll we'll take that as it as it comes type of basis. And uh, yeah, but we can happily debate canister filters. And uh, yeah, 
All right. I have a 55. I'm thinking about getting small fish. What would I put in it? I would put a grip of guppies. Tons of guppies is all you need. Guppies make the world go round. I love them. And I love them. Yes. Necessity only is one hell of a dull life. I'm not sure that's true. I think it depends on who's looking in. You know, I like to think of sometimes of what would my life be like without the internet? So I mean that if I was to live somewhere without the internet at all, maybe I would connect with nature even more. Like maybe I would do some farming. Maybe I would go fishing more often to catch food for myself. Like, and I'm not saying I would because I don't know, right? I obviously consume the internet in massive quantities at this point, but I'm not convinced that the opposite of that is also boring. I think to each their own. And I actually, if I, I, I do think in the future, if I keep up the pace I am that I am on the internet, that maybe in 10 years I need to detox from the internet and like have no internet for like a year or two. So I could see that and I bet it wouldn't be boring, but anything done for very long periods of time usually becomes boring to the human mind without any variation. So, uh, but yeah. I think necessity only, I think there's plenty of people in the world that live by necessity only, maybe, you know, maybe, I don't know if it's only in third world or second world countries or whatever, but I believe there's a lot of people that do that, and I don't know that their life is boring, I think it is, uh, you know, full of stuff, just as much as mine is, you know, whether I'm struggling about, you know, today I had to pick up my van because I had a, a recall, right, like that's, it's a whole other thing, so. Uh... Coming to drop some Corridoras off at the store. Great way to spend my birthday. Wow. Well, happy birthday tomorrow. Uh, so there is a needle in a haystack chance we'll run into each other. I have an appointment. I'm not going to say what time that appointment is over at the store with someone. And because I don't want it to become like, oh, there's 40 people here because I said what time it was. But there is a chance I'll run into you. Uh, if I do, make sure you say hi and I wish you a nice happy birthday. And if I don't see you, happy birthday either way. So, uh, is there any discount codes going on right now? I need some Dwarf Sag and some Anubius Nana Petite for a project. No, there's none going on right now. Um, yeah, we're, we're mostly just locked in on how can we reduce prices and improve what we're doing. We have some new stuff coming along for shipping stuff even better. And what I mean by better, it's not going to be faster, but it will be, you know, right now we did... We did a, I had an analysis run on shipping and out of, I think last, last month was 8,000 packages. We had 56 reships. And so the math on that is crazy low. That being said, we looked at the 56 we had to reship and we have identified like maybe a common theme for a few of them. And if we put that into place, it'll be even less. So, uh, but by putting that into place, it costs us a little bit more money, and so we're eroding away at the margins. Uh, there may, I'm sure there'll be a sale coming up at some point, uh, but at the moment right now, we don't have one going on, and yeah, you know, it's we do what we can, when we can, when a vendor presents an opportunity to us or something like that, or we, act, we make a mistake, um, but if everything's kind of firing right, it's like, yep, here's the great price we can offer you, and... We do what we can. So, you know, just today we talked with our plant vendor, one of our plant vendors again, trying to make some stuff happen. I was really hitting them up. They say they might have a source for uh, African fern bulbitis, so that'd be great to get into our hands so we can sell it to you guys. Um, you know, but in general, the co-op is fighting off rising costs every day. Shipping, some of the shipping methods went up again in June, you know, which... Even if our direct shipping rate doesn't go up, that means stuff that's shipped to us goes up. Right now, there's a lot of turmoil in the shipping industry with cargo containers and all that kind of stuff and tariffs and all that changes things. Like even if we order the same amount, but the rest of the world or the rest of the country is not ordering the same amount, uh, that could drive our our prices up. Like as you know, costs are the same, but less people are buying, naturally it goes up. So. Kind of the reverse effect. The more that you guys buy, the more I get to buy. Typically, I get to lower the price a little bit. You know, eventually we hit the floor on some items, but there's still a few more, I think, scaled options we can hit. And, uh, you know, we're working towards it. So, 
Uh, full metal's got some carob sea African cichlid mix. I plan on using it for a pea puffer tank and a better tank with neons. Will this be okay? The tap is seven. Uh, yeah, I would wager it'll be just fine for you as long as you're doing any amount of reasonable water changes. Something within at least a water change of like 30% once every three months. Oh, I'm getting like the hiccups going on. But uh, anything more frequent than that or that would work. You know, just don't go super long periods of time without it um, getting a water change and pH shouldn't creep up too high for you or anything like that. So, yeah. Uh, natural or Nocturnal Quest, a co-founder of Logistics Company emailed the store. Uh, we can help you with shipping costs. That may or may not be true, and I know we've gotten some of those emails. That would be in the stack of probably 400 this month. So I am not claiming that you cannot help us. I'm just claiming we are on a giant list of things we need to get through, and we've got some other projects in front that are, I don't want to say more important because shipping is a huge cost to us. But, um, you know, if you have specifics, you can email them to us, and we'll try to filter them up through the right way. Uh, but right now it's probably sitting in a giant folder that is a conglomerate of 4 billion people on how they can revolutionize our business. You know, that being said, uh, I welcome any actual stuff that will work. So, yeah. Uh, is there a video on how to build a sump filter? Yes. If you uh, go to the channel and you click that search icon that's on the channel, you type in sump, we definitely have a video that's about 30 minutes long on how we built a sump for the 800 gallon. Yeah. Um, what's the best filter put in an Ultim Nature System 60S? Hmm. What is, I don't know the dimension of the 60S, but it's probably... I would probably use a hang-on back. I realize that kind of goes against the aesthetic, but it depends on how you set it up in a room, whether a rimless tank like that and a hang-on back is appropriate. Um, yeah. That's what I got. Hmm. How many fairy cichlids in a 55 gallon? And what other fish can go well with them? So the fairy cichlid, also known as Neolamprologus um, burchardi, they've got a nice cool leer tail, Lake Tanganyikan cichlid. Very territorial, easy to breed, when you put them with other fish, they tend to dominate. So this is going to sound counterintuitive to what everyone else is going to say, but a lot of bigger body tetras, like the skirt tetras, black phantom tetras, Odessa barbs, which I know is not a tetra, that kind of stuff schools really well. And when the, uh, when the Burchardi kind of like, oh, looks at them and they just kind of swim away. Whereas other cichlids and stuff, they will try to fight for that territory. So it's kind of, I find it's kind of best to let them just kind of have that bottom half, put something nice and colorful up top, because typically they're not that colorful of a fish. Although I do, I am intrigued by the albino ones that are, you know, I don't want to, like newer, newish. They're newer to me. I haven't kept them yet. So I'm intrigued by the albino strains. So no 4th of July sale. Uh, I don't know. So I, we've been talking about, how we could do one, are there items that we can like, so the internal struggle is this, if we can afford to put it on sale, should we just drop the price? And part of it comes down to the way at which people buy. If you buy in a massive amount, like it, we can drop the price. If you buy one, we can't. So a perfect example, like this filter, this this filter, right? It costs me, the cheapest I can ship one of these, no matter what, is $13. If you buy two, it also costs $13. If you buy three, it also costs $13. Now, if you buy four, then it does go up again, right? So inherently, you'd be like, okay, but I, like if I just looked at it with a narrow scope, I could lower the price. But if everyone only buys one, I'll lose money. But if everyone was buying two or three, we could lower the price a little bit more. Right? And we already lowered it from 30 to 25 after looking at data and going, okay, most often this happens only 20% of the time are we losing money or not making any money. So we could, we could absorb that, right? So the kind of same analytical eye is going to a 4th of July sale. Can we do it? And if we can do it, should we? Or could we just alter some of these prices? Um, so we're looking into that. And 
I'm on the fence either way. Like, there's X amount of products we can't put on sale. There's X amount of products that there's not the margin there. There's some that there is the margin, but when you buy, you know, that product with something else, we may or may not lose money. Like, the reality is, right now, if you buy one of these sponges, right, it's $2. If you pay $5 shipping and this $2, it's going to cost us, if we ship it priority, seven fifty to ship it to you. If we ship it first class, about three dollars. So we actually make two dollars or two, two about about two dollars of shipping. We have to pay the employee and we have to pack it, right? But the minute you add this air pump, if you buy this, right? So now this is eight dollars, this is two dollars, ten dollars, right? Five dollars shipping. Okay? The problem is the shipping for this two items is seven fifty plus employee plus a little bit of material. So let's round that out to, you know, based on our minimum wage and all that kind of stuff, we we estimate that it takes about $1.50 to pack a package with packing supplies. If you order plants and heat packs and styrofoam, that gets more expensive, right? But it costs about $1.50 to package this correctly and get it out the door and the packing supplies that goes there. So we're into it, you know, for about uh, $9. We only collected $10. Right? So that means we only have a dollar left to buy these products. In that exact scenario, we also lose money. Right? So on these very small orders, we actually lose money, but we're doing that knowing we will probably gain a customer out of this. We'll impress them with our customer service. We'll sell them a good product. And someday they will come back and they go, hey, Corey said if you buy three of these at a time, that's good for shipping. Right? And uh, so yes, we we you know we take eight thousand orders, and you've got ten percent through that very small order. You got that ten percent through those giant orders, and you've got all this stuff in the middle that you kind of have to keep looking until your eyes cross and go, yes, we are making money. I yes, right, we're making seven percent. Oh, shipping chain four percent. Ooh, got a better buy price six percent. Like it's just it's always like etching one way or another. And so the data we do know is typically when we put something on sale, you guys will buy more of it. But now that we have things that's much lower pricing, you really have to add a lot to your normal cart size for it to make sense so that we don't lose money. And it's not that I don't want you guys to get products, it's that inherently everything we ship out that loses us money, it's like taking away from memberships and super chats and all that. So we have to look at it with a real fine tooth comb and we're thinking about maybe we can select a few products. Maybe we can't, maybe we're just going to drop the everyday price on them. If we can, like we, we kind of have to get agreements from our vendors. Like if they will agree to sell it to us at a price that we can still turn a profit on, we can do that. But if it's like a one-time buy, like, well, we, cause people freak out when the price goes up. Remember when the plants went up by a dollar, we took plants from 1299. Valisneria used to be 1299. We brought it down to 499. Then we found out, our price went up twice and we had to raise the price to $5.99, right? So from $4.99 to $5.99. Not a single person complained from $12.99 down to $4.99. But tons of people complained when it went up by $1. So we have to be very careful with public perception of, oh, if we have to increase price, people get very angry. So we have to make sure, is if we lower this price, is this something we can sustainably do and not just have to like, uh oh, that price went back up because of an unforeseen thing. So Fourth of July sale, uh, hoping so, hoping a fourth, hoping a Fourth of July live stream at the very least, right? And I'm sure I can find something where it's like, I don't, I was gonna say this is on sale. We know this won't be on sale. We already like it doesn't make us money. So something I'm sure will will happen. Maybe not huge though. So yeah. Um. Oof, I don't know what that is. People are ignoring Cichlids 23. All I can say for my, I don't know if you're addressing me or not, but uh, with this chat scrolling this fast, I can't uh, acknowledge everyone, but for today, at this moment, hello, Cichlid 23. So, yeah. I will say, uh, David Wilkinson, Wilkins, Wilkins, Gilkinson uh, says, and then there's, you're soon to be like, wait, my Chris, and then you're soon like me, who spent way too much money at the Aquarian Co-op because they're awesome. Not only does he spend, I'm assuming, a decent amount of money, because I actually don't know how much he spends, 
But uh, David also will email us when he notices a typo or a bug on the website, which really helps me debug the website, and that makes it better for everyone, and that's helpful. And he does it in the right way, not just like, your thing broke, fix it. It's like, here's how it broke. I took a screenshot. Here's what I think's wrong. And then I go, I get, once I open up that email, I'm like, oh, sweet. Oh, yeah, yeah you're right. Boom, got it done. And I'm always super thankful for that kind of stuff. And I realize there's some edge cases. I still think we have an error technically in Edge 10, which is like the new Internet Explorer, but in our analytics, like less than 1% of the Internet is using Edge 10. So it's on the to fix list, but also, yeah, let's, let's fix this and then we'll fix that type of deal. I mean, I've got a developer and he's got a list of things I want him to do, and hopefully he can source out the root of that bug. Uh, random question. Could you write a book on freshwater puffer care? Uh, no. I can make videos. I could... I can make videos and maybe a blog post. But books in general don't sell. And I am considering playing around when I get some time. And I don't have the time now. And I'm not sure when I would have the time. About making some like downloadable PDFs or something where I can keep the cost ultra low. Right? So it's like... Hey, for two bucks or three bucks or, you know, 10, I don't know. I don't, I know nothing about eBooks, right? Or like, for all I know, like, oh, paying the editor costs a ridiculous amount of money, right? Like, I don't, I don't know what the scale is, but I envision if I don't have to ship it and we don't have to create a physical book, I should be able to shave a ton of the cost off and do these like niche educational things. Like, hey, here's a thing, right? Like take my presentation on puffers write a lot of stuff out about it, flesh things out so it's more than just a 45 minute presentation into like, oh, it's actually a decent read, give you the video, give you the PDF, you spent $3.99 for it, and now that's accomplished a thing. Whereas if I made a physical book, maybe you gotta spend $22.95 and I made $1.12. I don't know, I don't know the, I've, I've never done a book, I have no idea what the profit is, I just know in general, books are a very hard sell in the aquatic industry at this point so uh yeah no plans to do a book on puffer care that being said the, the shrimp king wants to do a book with me on guppies and bettas and a few other things and that and by book it's more like a bigger magazine like a shrimp king magazines that may come to fruition uh but we are also both very busy people so All right. Um, what is my take on a two liter bottle CO2 system? And do you know any good carpet seeds? On the like DIY type of CO2, I think it's great to learn about CO2. Like Jimmy had one kind of going, he had the dental lake kit going on in his bedroom. I think he learned a lot about CO2. Then he ended up stepping it up. I think it's a great learning tool right like it's like a first car like yeah i want to learn a bunch right and then you can step up if you want to as far as carpet seeds go i've only ever ordered them i've never even planted them uh but from watching lots of people and there's like reddit groups and stuff talk about it most of them are never meant to be submerged grown or if they do they get so big and up and out of the aquarium they're not a good fit so i i think um yeah because the reason why I did research is I really thought it'd be great for us to sell. Oh, these carpeting seeds, why not sell them? You know, figure out where they're coming from, figure out how they work, and then, uh, you know, do that. But I've yet to see people really thrive long-term with them. Not, they might exist. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, so my opinion on the carpeting seeds is fun to play with because they're only a few bucks. But I don't have, like, super high hopes, right? It's kind of like, oh, dinner was only $3? Like, it's easy to be pleasantly spread. Like, that wasn't terrible. Okay. But if it was like, oh, $30, like, that was terrible. So they're cheap. I, I could, like, I, I think you could get $3 with a fun or $5 with a fun out of them for sure. Like, just as, let's see what this thing do. Like, I, that's worth a lot to me just to see what it does. So Jay Adams says, why don't you use slow shipping for free shipping? Every other pet site does that that I've seen. So first, we're not every other pet site. Let's let's that let's make that clear in that just because everyone else is doing something doesn't mean it's right. Like there's a lot of other things that I can make comparisons to. Now the main reason we don't ship slow is because the main benefit we get to offer our customers is that you can buy this 
and you can buy a live plant and we will ship it to you all for the same price. When you look at most other online vendors, most, they do not sell live goods and dry goods in the same shopping carts. Look at Live Aquaria, you know, that kind of stuff. You're like, oh yeah, spend this over here, spend this over here. These are how they ship. We have combined that so that you can save shipping and not have to do these weird logistics to make it happen. Uh, and it's our business model. And we also believe that every day that goes by, people are less tolerant of waiting. So, you know, our initial thing was we wanted to compete with Amazon. So we ship priority just like Amazon does. Now they're shipping some items in more markets same day. That is going to be very, very hard for us to compete with. That being said, they don't do that on any live goods. So that is always going to be like, okay, we still have that. Uh, but we're always looking to improve. And don't get me wrong. If the entire internet was like, no, we don't care. We'll wait 10 days. We would ship more goods slow. But plants, they will die. Well, that's not true. X amount of plants would actually make it through. Anubias, that kind of stuff, would make it through that 10 days. But there are plants that would not. A lot of the carpeting plants, they can't sit in the dark for 10 days. They can't sit in the heat for 10 days. Our heat packs won't last 10 days. There's a lot of things, right? So we, uh, we are trying to use volume and scale to lower those prices. We're negotiating. We're doing everything we can. Uh, but we also need to be reasonable in that if we have this for $2 and Amazon had it for $2, which they don't, uh, people would just order from Amazon because it's going to be free shipping free shipping and quick, right? We have to stay competitive and we have looked into thinking about what if we give people the option to ship slow? Maybe that makes sense, but I don't know that our logic um, on the back end of our software can do that. So I'm sure we could pay enough money to make it happen. Uh, but inherently we want you guys to buy plants. My goal is that all of you guys are buying plants. We actually looked at it. Uh, we looked uh, so Randy, you know, we brought him on. He came on in November or, or December, something like that. And he runs reports for me all the time. I go, hey, look into those numbers. I know that number's not easy to get to, but I think we went from 14% uh, of orders having plants into, in them to now, I believe, as of last month, it was 49%. So basically one half, one out of every two orders we ship have live plants in them. And it's my goal to get that even higher because... One of my main goals is connecting people with nature, getting people to understand nature, making positive changes. And the more people that have plants, the more likely that is to happen. So, uh, and the other type of shipping method leans itself towards the opposite of that outcome. So we're focusing on how do we do it better, faster? How do we do it more efficient, not cheaper? Like that's, I'm always careful with our company to go, we're not trying to do it cheaper. We want to do it more efficiently, you know? So it's like one way is to get, you know, get the cost down. Another way is, how do we get it so that it makes sense for our customer to spend more money and thus the shipping makes sense at this rate? So we focus on, let's do that instead of that. So, yeah. All right. Um, a lot of people talking about shipping. Oh, we got a super chat. We've got a couple of them. Uh, $1.99 from Justin, thank you. And one from Christopher. Uh, hi, Corey. Have been, oh, wait. Have been able to find a way to translate your shrimp care book from German to English. Uh, thank you and stay awesome. So I myself haven't written a shrimp book, but maybe it was uh, Chris, the Shrimp King, or maybe it was the uh, that German fish book that I, or German, where is it at? It would be right here. This signed... Uh, book I brought back from Germany about shrimp disease. So maybe you're speaking of that one, you're able to translate it and learn some about diseases, which would be cool. Um, yeah, this has got lots of illustrations, you know. Ooh, someday I should do like that, that school thing, right? Like I read, I read like this to you guys and I turn the page. Um, you know, but a lot of kind of parasite identification and, you know, it talks about like muscle necrosis and, and that kind of stuff cool book just not in english so you know and, and other things like you know right here we're talking micro siemens instead of tds and that kind of stuff so you got to do a little bit of hold on let me do that you know degrees hardness versus we use uh you know just normal hardness they use dkh uh but no that's cool that 
you know, and I, I just got this because I got the guy to sign it. And even if I can only gleam a little bit, like, oh man, I've seen something I've never seen before. If I can find it in the book, I can then use my phone to like Google translate it and, uh, you know, get me one step closer to the right Google word. So, all right. I need that book, but in English, yeah, I know. There's the 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 U.S. market does not do well with books, you know. And I, I don't, I, I I feel like maybe other markets do because I find a lot more books there. But for all I know, it's just a dying art there, and it's like, oh, it doesn't do well either. So, yeah, is the Razor by Magfloat a revolution? Razor by Magfloat. Do you fish folk? Uh, do you mean that the like the attachment? If you're talking about that, yes, that thing is magical. And there's been so many people that have emailed me and were like, you know what? You are right. Like I thought it was all hype. Then I got one and it's like way better. And that's all I can say is I did the same thing. I was, I poo pooed mag floats for like 10 years. Like, yeah, they're all right. You know, I've had them. Yeah. Yeah. They're all right. But once I put that blade on there, it became something that was like, yeah, they're all right to every aquarium must have one always. Like I never want to stick my hand in there. And then some people uh, have also emailed in saying like, oh, it really worked well for collecting Corydora eggs. Like there's some other uses. So, yeah. Are there any plans to ship fish within the U.S.? Uh, none currently. And that's, I, I'm unsure if I'll ever find the time to launch that without an employee stepping up or someone joining the team that we don't know about yet that really, um, that really is go get her. Like if we could bring Dean on, like uh, you know, Master Breeder Dean, if he wanted to ship fish, which I don't know that he does, but if he wanted to, I would be like, I'm intrigued. We could maybe go down this path, right? But it takes someone like that that really knows fish to pull it off. So Big D Smoke says, just don't try it on acrylic tank. No, they make acrylic blades. So like Corvus Oskin, every one of his tanks used it. He is he is who I helped or not who I helped. He helped me research it because I was on the fence. Like I liked the glass ones. I was like, ah, you end up scratching the, the acrylic ones. And he's like, all of my tanks run the acrylic ones with the blades. And I was like, really? Like your tanks are always clear. And he's like, yeah. And so, and then I tested on my own tanks. And I was like, you know what? He's right. So I'm not going to say you could never, uh, you could never scratch a tank, but in my experience it works really well. So yeah. Do I have any ideas on a plenum or kitty litter and laterite in a BCB for anoxic filtration testing both now? Uh, my opinion officially is that it's a giant waste of time for the home hobbyist. It's not that it doesn't work. It's that the amount of work you're going to uh, basically rid yourself of nitrates, you can do with a live plant. Makes way more sense in salt water, you know, uh, but... Yes, it's fun to learn about. By all means, keep going down that rabbit hole. But I do not believe it's something that will be adopted mass market because you're like, oh, you could have this kind of ghetto thing that's rigged up into a plenum that is cool. Or you could have this beautiful plant. And it's like, I'd rather have that beautiful plant. So I think that is why we'll never see widespread adoption outside of maybe zoos and uh, public aquariums, some, some saltwater systems and that kind of stuff. Cool concept, great to learn about all of it, um, but I, I think it's not necessarily practical. It'd be like me learning how to, I don't know, carve stone wheels or something. It's like, or I could just buy a car, right? Like, cool, love it, interesting how they, you know, oh, you had to craft this tool and this tool, and then this is how they did it, and here's where they did this. But then it's like, oh, but we just have better versions of that. And that's how I feel, um, that's how I feel about the plenums is like, ah, we just, the plants are just a better version of that. Really? You know, that's how I feel. So. Would I consider franchising to Canada? Uh, no, but I had been in talk, uh, talk with one person that wants to open up a store, not in Canada, uh, possibly helping them open a store, not financially or anything like that, but like they would pay me to really help, um, design the store and that kind of stuff and we have no idea on pricing and that kind of stuff 
But I, I, I told them flat out, not interested in franchising. I'm not interested in having another aquarium co-op that I have to either A, manage, or B, don't get to manage, in which case could ruin my reputation and that type of stuff. So, um, But I, I believe that it could be one and the same, whether you're Jerry's Fish Depot or your aquarium co-op. If I was there and you implemented a lot of the thinking that aquarium co-op has and did some of the same procedures and I did like a, a, a video about it and maybe it was at your opening, like that's pretty much like the tip of the hat of like, hey, I coach this, this group of people as well as I could. They believe in what Aquarium Co-op does. I believe at this point that they probably will be good people in the industry. You should try and support them. And if after two years they've done their job, you guys will love them much like Aquarium Co-op. And I think that, I don't think the actual name of Aquarium Co-op or not is the magical thing. I think it's the people underneath that name that make it happen. And, uh, so yeah, that's I wouldn't want to put my name on it, and then if they don't believe, oh dang, that that didn't go so well. So, all right, um, I need an East Coast store. I need maybe an East Coast warehouse. I don't know about another store. So yeah. Oh, basically, what I want is a zine or a book of pictures of pufferfish, with a little bit of info that doesn't take over the format. Maybe like a Nat Geo spread. Yeah, I, I think that's more similar to the way Chris does a lot of his uh, magazines, if you will. It's it's lots of good pictures, little bits of info, and that's what I'm – when I give presentations, it's pretty much here's a picture and then let me talk at you instead of here's a picture and then 40 bullet points of water parameters, chemistry, and then I read them to you. Like, I realize we want topical information, so, Yeah topical as in and then if you get through that and you're really interested then you can go deeper but most people go oh i'm just good at you know i'm good at good with that good enough don't need to you know don't need the entire farm of business and gravy just the one plate that's right we farm business and gravy here what's my best nightmare story that i've experienced with substrate just so happens i have a nightmare story to uh well that story probably won't take long enough to say to depart with, but uh, back in the day when I worked, I don't even know. I didn't. I don't think I worked at a fish store yet. I was still working in the as a like an oxygen person for um, a company, and I think I was just going and spending every dollar I ever had at the local fish store, which I ended up working at. And at some point, I had decided I wanted a planet tank. And I had a 110-gallon acrylic L-shaped tank. It went around a corner, three feet, three feet, with a common foot in the center. And 110 gallons at that point was a very large aquarium to me. And it took a lot of substrate. You know, it was like, and when, you, when I looked at, I think it was like fluorite and eco-complete. I don't know. I'm sure ADA existed, but I'm not sure it made it to America back then. And so I'm just like doing the numbers like, dang, I need like seven or eight bags. It's like 25 or 30 bucks a bag. Wow. And then I had the bright idea of like, wait a second. I'm smarter than this. Clearly they make substrate for ponds. I should just buy that. That's clearly like buying in bulk. So I go and I buy like three bags of pond substrate right so you could pot up your lilies and everything and it was it looked it looked like a different color of like fluoride i'm like yeah this stuff mm-hmm right so I, I i rinse it off i get that in there and it looks cool I'm like all right yeah i knew it and then i want to say like a week or two or three weeks later like some amount of time it was like the next day it was long enough that it was a while uh, all my fish started uh, getting sick, and I had a lot of clown loaches. I had a ghost knife, I, you know, big ghost knife. I had um, a Polynesian bleaker eye in there, and some other stuff. And I started to like, wow, they really look terrible. And it, it to me, and I was googling at that point, and I believe you could probably still find these threads on Monster Fish Keepers because that's where I was asking for advice back then. I bet you they're still there. Uh, and everything kept coming back to pH burn. And so I'd, I'd go test my water, and there's no nitrates. 
the pH is fine, you know, and I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, and so I do a big water change, you know, like 50%. You're like, well, when in doubt, change it out, right? We've heard that a million times. When in doubt, change it out. I do 50% water change the next day. They still look terrible. They look like they're getting worse day after day after day. Four or five days into this, now I'm losing fish. Fish are actively dying. Fish store doesn't know. Internet doesn't know. I don't know. <coughs> I'm down to like four or five fish from like, let's say I had 30 fish. I don't know what it was in there. And eventually, I test ammonia. And I test ammonia, and the chart, the color chart can't go higher. It's the highest level of ammonia that you can test on that kit. Meanwhile, pH is fine. Everything else is fine. So it turns out they're getting ammonia burns, not pH burns. Now, this is a tank, multiple canister filters. We're doing 50 to 70% water changes every day and not feeding because they won't eat. There's no way there could be ammonia. I'm not putting anything in. There's no way there can be ammonia. Oh, there's a dead fish, changed 70% of the water. There's no way that added enough ammonia. But it was super, super nutrient-rich substrate for ponds. Oh, you take this much substrate and then you put it into a 3,000 gallon pond, that's way different than taking that much substrate and putting it into 100 gallons of water. And that was the problem. I put like three bags when I bet if I really read on that package, it said like, oh yes, this will handle 5,000 gallons. And I'm thinking, yeah, because you're only going to do like five potted plants. And I'm going, I'm going to have tons of plants. I'll be fine, right? And that was where I learned, you know, whenever something's wrong, always test all of your water parameters. Not, you know, and, and I, I run into this with my employees. I run into it. I ran into it, you know, even with Bob Steen fought the other day. I go, nope, the first thing you do, you test every water parameter. You can't assume anything. I've been burned so hard a couple of times that I don't care that you tested ammonia yesterday. You test it today if today is the day you notice something's different. It, like it's that important. And when you, you know, I'm used to managing hundreds and hundreds of aquariums. That's the first thing you do. The first thing I do is I test all the water parameters I can. If TDS meter doesn't matter. If I have a way to test water, I'm testing it with everything I can. That takes 20, 30 minutes. It also focuses you on this tank and really looking at it and going, okay, what is going on? After that, if I have determined nothing, then I change water. Right, because then it's like, okay, maybe something I can't test for. Now I'm going to change water, and when I skipped that one step, I skipped testing ammonia. I tested hardness. I tested nitrite. I tested nitrate. You know, I just could not fathom there could be ammonia. I could have saved all of those fish. I'm pretty confident because we still kept a couple of fish alive when I scooped out all of the uh, all of the substrate. And to that point. Before I took out the substrate, there was a round of taking out all the plants. Like maybe they came with a pesticide. Maybe that's what's doing it. Then out came all the wood, right? And literally it was just fish and substrate at that point. And my brain could not comprehend how it could possibly be the substrate. And there it was. So it taught me a very valuable lesson. And it's teaching my employees the lesson, you know, because I, I pass it along to them. I'm now passing it along to you guys. Very, very important, and it happened relatively early in my career, which is great because it set me up to not make that mistake going forward again and again. And uh, yeah, so I look at that, even though it was a colossal failure and a bunch of stuff died, I'm thankful for it because it taught me so much. Like, I think I would have bumbled into some other stuff down the road, and I'd much rather have had that happen as a hobbyist than have it happen like, oh, I don't know what's going on in my store, stuff's just dying left and right, right? So good to happen at the beginning towards like right now. I'd be, I can't figure it out, guys. I don't know what to do. So yeah, uh, definitely, you know, thinking you're smarter, not always good. And, you know, I would say it's like 50-50. Five out of 10 things, like I am smarter. Five out of 10 things, I didn't have the right knowledge. That was not better. So, you know, I that's why I'm, I, I think I'm one of the most, um, apprehensive aquarist at this point like nothing is ever concrete in theory possibly i could probably think of a scenario where and that's just because i know that i've run into all these things that i thought were true so then i disprove myself and i prove it again and so i just know that i almost never have enough information to make an informed decision 
mostly my customers and people that email us don't have that information either. And so, you know, the perfect example is fish die for us all the time as Aquarius. The reality is we'll never know if it was cancer, was it a tumor, was it a heart attack, was it malnutrition, was it a disease, was it temperature that led to a life, shorter life. There's all these things we don't know. Instead, we're desperately grasping for something like, I need the reason, and we'll never find that out. And so, yes, question everything, and uh, hold on. Stop the show. Ray says, has your crew let you try any of the salmon jerky? If you legitimately sent smoked salmon or salmon jerky to my store, I am very sad I haven't had any because I love smoked salmon and I love uh, like jerky like that. So if that went down, my employees, I better hear about how I can try some. Cause I just, I don't, not that I have to get it. I don't need it all. I just want to partake in it. I share all the candy and stuff. So if that went down, oof, yes. Uh, let's see here. I know I'm wrapping it up. I'm just making sure I didn't miss anything too, too crazy. Yeah. So no, I haven't. I guess Candy asked as well. No, I haven't. I'll try it. So. I'll try and remember to ask someone and see if it magically disappeared or if it's like, there's there's a lot of things that every time I show up, there's like, don't forget this, 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 and this, and that could just be off the radar or it could have landed yesterday, in which case, hey, they've got more than enough time. So, uh, it's seven o'clock. I have to drive to the airport now. Traffic has subsided. Gotta make sure I get there before they close. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna touch on one last one because I know he's been patiently asking. Fuzzy white algae slime to touch only on the plants appeared while treating with erythromycin ichex and a tablespoon of salt for five gallons. Any ideas? White, fuzzy white slimy algae. To me, that seems like rotten food or something like that. Um, without a picture, it's really hard. If it's real hairy, I think it's a hair type of algae, but it could be something weird I haven't seen before. Some kind of water mold or a fungus. Um, I remove it with like a net or something and then see if it keeps coming back. But I've dosed plenty of times and never had a problem with those meds. So I don't think it's specifically those meds, uh, interact with that, but you never know, right? In theory, that's how that works. But you could have some crazy thing going on in your water. Don't know. Thank you for all the super chats. Thank you to those that, uh, have become members. Thank you that might to the people that might take the time to create a Google account and subscribe, and maybe you turn on notifications. Uh, maybe I, sh I should hit this thing, like make sure you do all that stuff, subscribe, get the notifications, turn the notifications on in your app so that you don't miss the cool videos that are gonna come out. And I do believe I might start trying to live stream at some different times because yeah, I like live streaming when I like to live stream, not necessarily always at the same time. So thank you guys for hanging out and I'm out and on the road again. Woo-wee. If I can find the right button. Oh, it's over here. Thank you all, and we'll see you probably next week, I would guess. Probably for a 4th of July live stream, I would. Yeah, because that's like on a Thursday. Probably wouldn't do one Wednesday and Thursday, so probably just Thursday. All right. We'll see you later. Uh, watch the two-hour live stream somewhere on the screen here. Two-hour live stream episodes. Cue that up. Do all your housework. Do all your chores and listen to all the infinite knowledge. So have a good night, guys.